Hey guys, welcome to class. And this session we are gonna talk about manual transmissions and transaxles and how they work. So just getting into it, I think it's important to know the difference between a transmission and a transaxle because these terms get used synonymously all the time and they're really kind of the same. They have the same function, but they're not the same and they don't belong in the same vehicles. So a transmission is going to be generally used in rear wheel drive vehicles. So if we're looking at a picture down here at the bottom, we've got our engine up at the front, off of the engine, so our engine's mounted longitudinally, meaning from front to back. And mounted on the back of that engine is our transmission, also mounted longitudinally from the engine to toward heading toward the back of the vehicle. Now, in a rear wheel drive vehicle, I'm gonna have some sort of member that's gonna transfer movement from my transmission to the back wheels. And that's going to be my drive shaft. So if we look back here, I've got a drive shaft coming from my transmission back to my differential. And I'm gonna talk about differential or, or put some videos in this week's Canvas Shell for differentials. Um, but in a nutshell, your differential is in a, a sort of, uh, in a, I don't want to say a transmission. It's not a transmission, but it is another set of gears that's going to help take movement coming from my drive shaft, and it's going to separate it into two wheels. In a nutshell, my differential in the back here is going to allow my right and left wheel to spin at two different speeds because when you're turning, you need to be able to do that. So my transmission is going to transfer power through my drive shaft to my differential, out through my drive axles to my rear wheels. I know that's like a bunch of stuff. Now, uh, rear wheel drive vehicles are great. And most of your larger vehicles like trucks and SUVs are rear wheel drive. A lot of your sports vehicles are going to be rear wheel drive. Um, most of your cars are not rear wheel drive. Uh, especially your economy vehicles, things like that, and less and less cars are rear wheel drive because there's all these extra components involved and they do cost a little bit more to make. Um, and they also provide a little bit of extra weight, so we're thinking of gas mileage and things like that as well. So what we do is we make a lot of front wheel drive vehicles. Notice there's not anything going on in the back of the vehicle. So I've got my engine that's mounted transversely from side to side. Um, and off of that engine is going to be a transaxle that is also mounted from uh, uh, side to side as well, transversely. I'm going to take power that's coming from my engine and I'm going to transfer it to my transaxle. So a transaxle is going to do the same job as the transmission, but it's for front wheel drive vehicles. So it's going to be mounted transversely. And it's also going to include, and this is an important part, your transaxle is going to include a differential. So no longer do we have a transmission and a differential in two separate places. Your transaxle is going to take all of those components and put them in one. That's going to separate power to my right and left drive wheels up in the front. Now, with that being said, notice I say usually there are exceptions. And um, I'd say the most common exceptions or the ones that you guys would probably see the most are going to be your uh, Toyota MR2 and your Chevy Corvette. So the Toyota MR2 is a rear wheel drive vehicle that uses a transaxle. Why? Because your engine is not in the front anymore, it's in the rear. And since our engine is in the rear, it doesn't need a drive shaft or a differential because everything is already back here. So it uses a transaxle to transfer power to my right and left drive wheels in the rear. So everything's all in the rear. It's pretty much a front wheel drive setup in the rear of the vehicle. That's what Toyota did. Chevy did something a little bit different. So Chevy in the Corvette, has an engine up in the front, longitudinally, just like any rear wheel drive vehicle would be. And instead of a drive shaft, they have something called a torque tube because directly off of the engine, we are transferring power. There's no, no transmission there. We're transferring power to the rear. And instead of having a just a differential back here, so normally we'd have the engine, the transmission, a drive shaft, a differential, and drive axles to our wheels, right? 
with the Chevy Corvette, we've got the engine, a torque tube, and we put everything together in a transaxle back here. So our, our transmission and differential are all in one in the rear of the vehicle. We call that a transaxle, and that's going to put power to our drive axles out to our drive wheels in the rear. So there are variations, but in general, the majority of vehicles that are rear wheel drive will use a transmission. The majority of vehicles that are front wheel drive are going to use a transaxle. Now, regardless whether it uses a transmission or a transaxle, um, what do those do? Why do we even have those? Why do we need a middleman in between my drive axles and my engine? Your engine only provides a certain amount of torque at a very narrow RPM range. Um, and we're not always running at that RPM range. I need to be able to have enough torque, turning or twisting force to get my vehicle from a stop rolling, right? When I'm leaving a stop sign or a red light. And I also need to be able to have enough wheel speed when I'm cruising at freeway speed, 65 miles an hour. So how do you get both of those? I need gears. I need different size gears. So if you've ever ridden a bicycle, like a 10 speed or anything like that, that has gears and you've used those gears, you'll notice that in a lower gear, it's very easy to pedal, very, very easy to pedal, but you can't go very fast, right? You'll be pedaling, 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 and the bike's barely going along, but you can go up a hill like nothing. You just won't go very fast. Now, as you go up into the higher gears, it's really hard to pedal from a stop, but once you've gained some speed, you can go really fast. That is exactly what your transmission is doing. It's using input gears and output gears and utilizing gear ratios to either A, multiply torque, or B, multiply speed. So that's what our transmission or transaxles are doing. Now, instead of calling them input or output gears, we can call them drive gears and driven gears, right? I've got one gear that is being uh, sort of the, the drive or it has the torque. Um, the other gear is simply being driven off of that gear. Now, the sizing of those gears is what's going to either multiply torque or multiply speed. So I've got two external cut gears that are rotating in two different directions, and the sizing of those gears is what's going to, to give me either more torque or more speed. Now we're basing that off of the number of teeth as well. So you can see this one, I've got a drive gear that is small and a driven gear that is large. What's that gonna give me? So there's gonna be three separate options. The first one's going to be a gear reduction. That is what we just saw. So we've got a drive gear that is tiny and a driven gear that is large. That's your low gear on your bicycle. Um, that means that my drive gear is gonna spin a lot faster than the driven gear. So if we're looking at a picture like this, uh, we can say I've got nine teeth on my drive gear and 27 teeth on my driven gear. So my drive gear, the one that's providing the torque, is spinning a bunch of times while my driven gear is not spinning near as much. And if we want to get the actual gear ratio of that, I can take 27, divide that by nine, and I get three. That means for every three rotations of my drive gear, I only get one rotation of my driven gear. Now, why would you wanna do that? If you want to multiply torque, meaning you want to take this much torque, you want to take this much torque and you want to get this much torque, you would use a gear reduction. Meaning, um, again, you're on your bicycle and you want to go up this crazy hill, right, without killing yourself. You're going to take your gear all the way down to the lowest gear you have, which is a gear reduction. And you're going to be able to pedal fairly easily. You're multiplying your torque that you're applying to your crank and what you're getting out the back wheel is a whole lot more torque than what you're putting in. So you're multiplying the amount of torque you're putting in. Nothing in this world is free. So what you're gonna sacrifice is speed. 
So you're going to multiply torque, but you're going to sacrifice speed, which is why you'll make it up the hill fairly easy, but you're going to go at a turtle's pace. That's why when you're in first gear in a vehicle, you can take a vehicle that weighs 3,500 pounds and take it from a stop no momentum at all and allow it to move forward. That's a lot of torque. Your engine doesn't make that much torque, uh, at, at least a, at low RPMs. You'd have to get a much higher RPM to be able to get that out of it. So in order to compensate, we use a transmission with a gear reduction in first and second gear and usually third gear as well. And as you go, so you're from a stop, you're in a manual transmission vehicle, you press in the clutch pedal to disengage your clutch. You put the vehicle in first and you let off the clutch pedal to engage your clutch and the car starts to move forward. You engaged first gear, which is a gear reduction, multiplying torque, which allows your vehicle to move forward. If you, was, if you were to remain in this gear, any of you who have driven a manual transmission vehicle know this, your max speed in first gear, you'll be redlining at 20 miles an hour, right? Wah, 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 wah. You've got a ton of torque, but no speed at all. So then you switch to second gear. Second gear is also a gear reduction. It's just less of a gear reduction. So we'll say maybe second gear is a two to one gear ratio where my driven gear is slightly larger or my drive gear, uh, I'm sorry, my, my drive gear is slightly larger or my driven gear is slightly smaller. They get closer in size. So we'll say this one has nine teeth and this one has 18 teeth rather than the one before with 27. If I take my 18 divided by nine, I get two. That means for every two rotations of my drive gear, I get one rotation of my driven gear. I am still multiplying torque, just not near as much as when I had a three to one gear ratio. With that, I get torque multiplication, just not as much, which means I don't sacrifice as much speed. So in second gear, I can go a little bit faster, but again, I don't have that same amount of torque. So as I go into third gear, those gears get closer in size. I will still have a gear reduction, but it won't be near as much. And so maybe I've only got a one and a half to one gear ratio. So we're multiplying torque a little bit and we're only losing a little bit of speed. So I can go a little bit faster. I don't need as much torque because I already have momentum going forward. I got that momentum from first gear, second gear, and now we're going a little bit faster. So I don't need as much torque to gain that momentum. Now, once I've reached a certain speed, I'm gonna shift into fourth gear. Fourth gear usually, um, and I'm just saying usually different transmissions might have different ratios for different ones, but generally first and second are always gonna be gear reduction. Third is usually a gear reduction, not in all vehicles. Um, in a four speed, it may not be a gear reduction, but in most manual transmission vehicles, fourth gear is a direct drive. So uh, one of two things. Usually I'm not using a gear at all. I'm simply um, tying my input shaft and my output shaft together so they can spin together. Um, but you can think of it as having two gears that are exactly the same size. I am not multiplying torque at all. I'm not losing any speed or multiplying speed. I'm, whatever I put in, torque and speed, is what I get out, torque and speed. Um, so like I said, that's usually your fourth gear. We call that a direct drive or a one-to-one, -one. no multiplication at all of anything. Now I'm getting onto the freeway. I've already reached enough speed to where I don't need to gain any more momentum. I just need to maintain my momentum or maybe go a little bit faster. So in, I need to multiply my speed rather than my torque. How do I do that? I do that with an overdrive. An overdrive is the opposite of a gear reduction, meaning my drive gear is actually larger than my driven gear. And again, on your bicycles, it works the same way. So when I go into a higher gear, I'm going into an overdrive gear. Um, we can say, uh, let's say our drive gear has nine teeth and our driven gear has six teeth. I always take my driven and I divide it by my drive. So my new gear ratio, because our ratio is always to one, now looks like point. It'll always be less than one. So it could be point whatever, but it'll be 0.6 in this case, 
0.6 to 1. That means for uh, every one rotation of my driven gear, I only have 0.6 rotations of my drive gear. My driven gear is going to be spinning faster than my drive gear. This is going to be, if you're on a bicycle, it's going to be harder to pedal from a stop, but once you gain some speed, you're going to be able to get that back wheel to spin much faster at a higher speed. So with an overdrive scenario, you're multiplying speed, but again, nothing in this life is free, so you're going to sacrifice torque. So you don't have as much, in fact, not only are you not multiplying torque, you are actually reducing the amount of torque that, are, that is being applied. However, you are multiplying speed. So you can go so much faster in a high gear. But this is precisely why you would not want to have to come from a stoplight, put your car in fifth gear, and try to let off the clutch. A lot of times, you're either going to stall out or you're gonna have to feather the clutch so much um, so you don't stall out and that's not necessarily healthy on your clutch either. So uh, your overdrive is going to be your higher gears, fifth and sixth gear. Um, like I said, more for freeway speeds rather than um, for torque multiplication. So we've got a uh, gear reduction, we've got a direct drive, and then we have an overdrive, which is going to get us up to speed. And the reason why we do this is it's going to help save some gas mileage. It's not as hard on the engine. I can take speed coming out of the engine. I'm able to multiply it coming out of my drive wheels. So if we're looking at the transmission, this is a transmission. I'll talk about a transaxle in a moment. I've got an input shaft. Here's our splines that my clutch is going to be hooked up to, right, or spline to. I've got my input and I've got my output coming out the back of my transmission. I think it's very important to know because you can't see it in this picture here that my input and my output are not connected. You can sort of think of them as being like this. I've got my input and my output. And what's going to connect them is this shaft down here that, uh, that, that we can call a cluster shaft or a counter shaft. And when you're thinking of shifting gears in your vehicle, you're not actually meshing and unmeshing gears. Instead, these gears are always in mesh. Um, it's much easier this way. Um, we don't damage components. It's a much uh, better design for longevity. But all of these gears are meshing together all of the time. What you're doing is you're designing or, or you're uh, designating when you go to shift which gears are going to get torque applied to them from the input shaft. So our first set of gears, they are simply input gears. So I've got power coming from the engine, I've engaged my clutch, and I'm going to spin my input shaft. My input shaft is going to spin this input gear, which is going to transfer power down to my input gear on my cluster shaft. Now, these are going to all be first, second, third, fourth, right? All that fun stuff. Let's find first gear. So right here it says first gear. Um, we can tell first gear, well, we already know first gear is going to be a gear reduction, right? Gear reduction means I've got a small drive gear and a large driven gear. And let's look at it. This says first gear, but if I didn't know, let's say none of these were labeled, how could I know? Well, if I know this shaft is sort of the input to everything, I would pick my smallest gear, which is about right here. This one's actually our reverse, so that one doesn't count. This is my smallest gear, and I can see this is my biggest gear on this shaft, so this must be first gear. So I'm gonna transfer power from my input shaft to my input gears, down to my cluster shaft, and down here, my first gear is already meshing with my first gear on my output shaft. And I am going to, when you go to shift the transmission, you're actually going to move a little fork that's going to select which gear gets torque applied to it. And we do that through something uh, called synchros or synchronizers. So synchronizers are these yellow pieces here and your clutch fork, or sorry, not clutch fork, your shift fork is going to attach to these synchronizers. And when I go to select first gear, 
When I go to put it in first gear, that shift fork is going to select first synchronizer and it's going to engage my first gear set. And once my first gear set is engaged, this gear is now able to drive this gear, which is able to transfer power out of my output shaft. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but let's go through second gear. So I'm gonna pick the next one up, which is probably this gear, and yes, it is in fact second gear. So power comes through my input gears down to my cluster shaft. Uh, we've got our second gear right here. So when I shift into second, the synchronizer is the first and second synchronizer. So it's gonna shift back, engaging my second gear, which will then transfer power out to my output shaft that way. And it's gonna go so on and so forth as you go through third gear. When I go through fourth gear, none of these gears are really labeled fourth gear. Why? All we're doing is direct drive through my input, out through my output. So I don't need any gears, I just need to connect my input and my output so they're spinning at the same speed. That would be a direct drive, so I don't need any gears for that. Now when I go to fifth gear, I'm going to engage my fifth gear synchronizer um, when I go to switch into fifth gear, which uh, in this transmission is the highest gear it goes. I know some transmissions will go to sixth gear, right? Well, this one, um, in fact, on most vehicles, when you go to shift into fifth, you know, you usually have to go all the way to one side and then up or down depending on the transmission. That's because it's on a separate synchronizer, which is why you're going around. When I engage my fifth synchronizer, notice this is the largest gear on my cluster shaft, spinning the smallest gear on my output shaft. And that is going to multiply speed coming out of my output shaft. So in a nutshell, that's sort of how that works. I'm gonna go ahead and include a couple YouTube videos that probably have better visuals for you in my canvas shell um, to, to sort of help out, but hopefully that makes sense. The synchronizers themselves, without getting too much into it, I'll leave that for a transmission class, look sort of like this. It's actually an entire assembly with a sleeve and a couple of what we call blocking rings. Now, when I go to engage a gear, I don't want to just abruptly uh, apply torque to that gear set. What I want to do is sort of slowly apply it, that way we're not breaking anything. So we sort of have to be able to, uh, we sort of have to be able to engage them smoothly. And in doing so, we're gonna speed match, right? So if the gear I'm about to select is not spinning very fast already, I wanna get it up to speed gradually. So in doing that, we have a mechanism called blocking rings, which are gonna go on a uh, sort of hub of the, uh, the gear. So if we're looking at this here, as far as synchronizer operation, let's say the gear I want to engage is this gear, right? Let's say it's uh, third gear. So this is my third gear gear. Hanging off of my third gear is going to be sort of a shoulder that has a little cone hanging off of it. Well, my blocking ring, and this is a synchronizer blocking ring. Notice there's little teeth on the outside as well to help engage. But if you look at the inside of your blocking ring, and I, I don't know if you guys can actually see that. Let me see if I can get it to where, there we go. Inside of my blocking ring is a bunch of little um, sort of cuts in my blocking ring. And these are really sharp. If you run your fingers along it, you can actually cut your fingers on there. But these, these uh, sort of cutouts in here, these lines on my blocking ring, are going to get pressed up against my cone or shoulder of my gear. And as it does that, it's actually going to match the speed of my synchronizer onto my gear, which is gonna speed up or slow down the gear I want to engage. Um, so when you're grinding gears, or you hear grinding, these blocking rings are actually worn out. So when, when you're shifting your manual transmission vehicle and you go to put it in gear and it goes ee, ee, right? You're, it sounds like you're grinding a gear. You're not actually grinding a gear. You're grinding the synchronizers because the blocking rings are worn out. So the synchros for that gear are worn out and need to be replaced or serviced. So if that's something that you're running into, um, 
You'll notice it happens when you're at higher RPMs, right? Maybe you're power shifting or something like that. That generally means that your synchronizers are going bad and need to be replaced. So power flow through first gear, we kind of already went through this, right? Through our input gears down out and spinning our output gear. Second gear, same thing. Third gear, uh, right here. Third gear, same thing. Input gears out through our third gear. And fourth gear is a direct drive connecting our input straight to our output. Here's, uh, oh, here's reverse. I didn't talk about reverse. In order to get your output to spin in the opposite direction, to get your wheels to spin in the opposite direction for reverse, you actually need a third shaft with a separate gear on it. This gear doesn't have a synchro. This gear is actually a gear that is meshing and unmeshing, which is why you have to be pretty much perfectly at a stop to engage reverse or it will grind. Um, and when you're grinding reverse, you are actually grinding your reverse gear. So be very careful with that. Don't try to shove reverse into gear when you're not at a stop. Um, so so that we have sort of a little idler here that a reverse gear spins on as a third member. Now, with that being said, how does your transaxle work? Because if the transaxle is your transmission, but sort of shoved into a much smaller assembly. So we still have, uh, they're calling this a main shaft, but that's gonna be sort of um, an input there. So as we have our input coming from our transmission, they're saying first gear is right here. So I've got first gear that may be engaged coming down to here. Our synchronizers are in between here. And when my uh, first gear is engaged, it's going to transfer. So transaxle power flow always comes in and back out sort of in the same place. And then it's going to transfer power no matter where it's coming from down here, which is essentially our differential, also known as a final drive. And our differential is going to transfer power out through our left and right axles. So if we're looking at the power flow through a transaxle, we've got uh, from our clutch assembly coming in, power flow through first gear, down through our differential, just like I showed you. Power flow through second gear, same thing, just through a different gear, again, out through our differential. Third gear, we move up, right? We are uh, still in the gear reduction, but we have less of a gear reduction. So power flow down through our back gears here, again, down through our differential. And then fourth gear, we actually have gears in this situation. So we've got power flow all the way through our input. Here is our input fourth gear gear, and here's our output fourth gear gear going through uh, all the way through the shaft down through our differential, no torque multiplication, no speed multiplication. And here's um, a fifth gear would do the same thing, um, but it does, I don't have a picture for that one. Um, and we would be multiplying speed in an overdrive situation. This one is reverse. Again, there's a third member that's really hard to show because this is a 2D or two-dimensional uh, picture. But if it was 3D, you would see a third shaft or a third gear coming off of that. Um, to transfer power again down through our differential. I go ahead. I went ahead and I posted a video. Um, I'll, I'll put this link separately in the Canvas shelf for you guys as well. So that's the end of our manual transmission video. Hopefully that makes sense. Like I said, I recommend that you watch the uh, other YouTube videos. They probably have better visuals, but that's gear ratios in a nutshell. That's the difference between transmissions and transaxles. Um, I will go ahead and post some videos about differentials and drive axles as well as part of this module. So uh, let me go. Again, if you guys have any questions, post them in the comments or send me an inbox message and I will see you guys in this week's Zoom session.